Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people interested in transport issues at 8.30 in the morning. Um, my name is Andy Carbonin. I'm an associate professor here at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Um, and we'll see how this goes with the uh, online seminar. So I'm gonna to talk today about sustainable urban innovation, the promise and peril of laboratories, experiments, and test beds. And I'll pause uh, maybe every five minutes or so to see if there's questions, um, maybe take a little break. I know this is a bit, uh, a bit strange to be, to be having a seminar online, but uh, hopefully we can make it, make it work. So if you went to Shista, which is a suburb of Stockholm uh, in 2018, you could see uh, the future of transportation unfolding in real time. The Swedish transportation agency tested its first autonomous shuttle, did trials at 10 kilometers per hour, then 20 kilometers per hour, and then 40 kilometers per hour. And what they wanted to do is demonstrate the future of autonomous vehicles. What was interesting about this, this happens all over the world. I think many of us know about this, but, but what was really interesting about this was that this was happening on public streets in the real world. I teach a course on urban infrastructure and my students and I went up there when they were testing the shuttle and the students got on board and they said, this is going to be great. We're going to, we're going to try out the autonomous shuttle. And they, uh, they rode on it for about five minutes and then they, they walked back and I said, Oh, how'd it go? And they said, Oh, it was interesting. Um, we got to an illegally parked taxi and the autonomous shuttle didn't know what to do. Uh, and so the, the driver said, oh, you know, you need to get out. I need to take over control of the, the shuttle uh, and go around this taxi and then we can start again. Um, so it was kind of funny to see. This wasn't a failed experiment, of course. This was instead, this was just, um, you know, part of testing uh, in the real world. And the, the shuttle didn't anticipate a, a taxi parked at the curb. So, but this autonomous shuttle is uh, part of the urban ICT arena, which many of you have probably heard about, this public-private partnership that was launched two or three years ago. Um, so this includes Ericsson and IBM and Cisco and Intel, and they've joined up with the city of Stockholm, with the National Research Institute of Sweden, with KTH, with Stockholm University, um, to trial different smart city solutions uh, in the real world. So in addition to these autonomous shuttles, they're looking at open Wi-Fi standards, they're looking at Internet of Things devices, they're looking at drones, they're looking at droids, um, they're looking at lighting and parking, all kinds of different things related to smart uh, cities. And the idea is to, to make these things uh, a reality and to try them in the world. And all this stuff is part of this new ethos, I would say, or this new attitude that we have in cities to really invent, to innovate, to foster entrepreneurialism, to foster experimentation. And these are becoming these very strong drivers of urban development. So we see this, of course, with smart cities uh, all the time, but we also see it with the rise of privatization. We see it with the threats of climate change. We see it with social instability and unrest. We see it in changing economic systems, uh, different forms of of, uh, of entrepreneurship. Um, and it's not something that's necessarily new to cities. We've seen entrepreneurialism, particularly since the 1970s, has been uh, a, a driver of, the, of urban development. Um, but today we're seeing it come back with a vengeance and we're seeing uh, a lot of focus on digitalization. Michael Batty, who's a, an esteemed professor at uh, University College London, wrote a book called Inventing Future Cities. Uh, and he says that we are at the start of an inventive century, uh, there is no doubt. Um, we're at the start of this inventive century where it's disruptive uh, and, and um, this is becoming the new norm for cities. Um, there's interesting parallels here, I think, with uh, the rise of infrastructure networks in the 19th century. So in the 1800s, we saw water, we saw wastewater, we saw electricity, uh, and we seem to be moving into a period where we're re reworking these systems in fundamental ways. Uh, we're starting to digitalize them, we're bringing them online, um, and they're having both positive and, and negative effects. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is um, the spaces of innovation. Um, so this says that the, the innovation and experimentation happen in particular places. They have a physical presence. 
to have a material presence. Um, and it varies what types of technologies they're using, uh, what types of measurements they're doing, what types of learning is happening, what types of partnerships, if it's focused on economics, if it's focused on environment, if it's, social, it's focused on social issues. Um, but these are, 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 are places uh, where innovation is occurring in cities. And I think one of the interesting things about this is, is that um, they're becoming a, a very dominant way that we think about how cities change. So Baz Van Hur, a colleague of mine, and I have argued that urban laboratories at the front line of new economic, cultural, political, and societal configurations in cities. So it's through experimentation that we want to achieve sustainable ends. So the idea is being economically prosperous, of being environmentally friendly, uh, of being socially equitable. So we see these really nice alignment between experimentation and sustainability and resilience and, and livability. But there's fundamental questions that we can ask now. We can say, you know, what kind of worlds are we creating when we laboratorize cities? What types of experiments are we conducting and what do we hope to gain? And what are we potentially gonna lose by doing these experiments? So my background is as a geographer and as an urban planner, uh, and I do qualitative research. Uh, I'm interested in, in the way that, that technologies influence cities and the way that cities influence technologies. So I draw on a field called science and technology studies, uh, and I try to connect that up with, with urban studies to understand how technologies are related to urban sustainability, how it's related to transitions, how it's related to transformations. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the way that cities and technological development co-evolve. How do they come together? How do they, how do they support one another? How do they contradict one another in different ways? So I want to take the next, um, sorry, I'm just trying to click here. Uh, I want to take the next uh, 30 minutes or so uh, and ask uh, kind of three different things. First of all, I want to, to explore this idea of urban laboratories and experimentation. What does it mean uh, when we experiment in cities? Can cities actually serve as laboratories? Isn't that a, a kind of a strange oxymoron to, to talk about an urban laboratory? And then I want to talk about living laboratories uh, and collaboration. How is a living laboratory different than an urban laboratory? And then finally, I want to talk about the implications for urban development and for sustainability. What, what does this all add up to? What does this mean? So I'm going to give you some, some, a couple of examples uh, that, that we can, that we can uh, think about as we're thinking about experimentation and laboratories. Um, but I'd also like to hear your feedback uh, if you have experience with these types of interventions in cities and what they mean. And I should also put a qualifier in here that I'm not a transportation expert, uh, but a lot of these experiments, a lot of these laboratories and test beds and platforms and similar initiatives have something to do with transportation, have something to do with mobility. Um, so it'd be interesting to think about what, what are the particular mobility and transportation dimensions that come out of the, the sustainable city as an experiment, uh, as a laboratory. So I'll stop there just for a second. Any quick questions before, before we move on? Okay. Well, I know I just started, so I'm not surprised. Let me uh, close out that window and I'll, I'll just keep talking here. Okay, so let's start out with a very basic question, which very important question is what is an urban laboratory? Um, we use this term in very loose ways. Um, but if we go back to science and technology studies, so this is this, this field of study that I look at, um, we can really start to understand what laboratories do. Um, so science and technology studies scholars in the 1970s and 1980s went into into natural science laboratories because they were interested in this idea of knowledge production. They said, we think that there's something really important happening when scientists work in laboratories. Um, and, and what they found was that, that there, was, there was really important things that were happening uh, and that the knowledge that's generated is, is formal, but it's also very important and long lasting uh, and has big impacts on society. Oops, skipped. 
So Karen Norsatina, who's uh, one of the one of the more prominent STS scholars who studied laboratories, said uh, the laboratory is an enhanced environment uh, that improves upon the natural order as experienced in everyday life in relation to the social order. So the idea there um, is that that we need to recognize that that laboratories aren't just places where natural scientists go with uh, their white lab coats and their microscopes uh, and generate scientific knowledge. They do things, they produce new knowledge that then goes out and is used in the world. Uh, so the sociologist Tom Guerin has called these truth spots. So the idea is that, that, that we generate knowledge that, that, that then is very important uh, outside of the laboratory walls. So we need to think about the, the, the social implications of scientific knowledge development. Um, and it forces us to ask particular things. What kind of worlds are we creating when we experiment? Uh, what kind of assumptions do we have? What kind of experiments are being conducted? Uh, what happens with the experimental outcomes? Where do they go? So once we start thinking about laboratories kind of in a, a deeper way, hopefully that's a deeper way, um, we can start to think about urban laboratories. And the, the notion of urban laboratories is, is longstanding. It's been around for 100 years or more. Um, and a very famous place in urban studies, if you followed urban studies history, urban planning history, is the Chicago School of Sociologists. Uh, and this was in the 1910s and the 1920s. And they went out into Chicago and they said, we can study Chicago as uh, an, an urban laboratory. We can look at what people are doing, what the population of Chicago is doing in situ, in place, right? Um, and we see that idea of urban laboratories has come back. Uh, and we see researchers like myself, but also companies, politicians, policymakers are referring to districts of cities as urban laboratories or entire cities uh, as urban laboratories. And so the basic idea of an urban laboratory is that it's, it's a, a particular location uh, where we conduct experiments uh, and then we generate results that we can apply elsewhere. And laboratories are, are attractive um, because they, they really uh, respond directly to a wide range of contemporary issues. And that might be climate change, that might be traffic congestion, that might be air pollution, uh, that might be social inequity. Uh, but it's, it's a way to respond directly to, to these issues uh, in a very tangible way. And it also prevents, pre provides novelty. Uh, so the idea is that we can, we can have a, a, a we, we don't want to have gradual change in cities, which is always happening. Uh, but instead, we want to catalyze these new strong breaks from the existing way that, that cities develop. So um, it's also important to know with urban laboratories, it's not just restricted to scientists. It's not just restricted to those people that know how to do the experiments. Um, it can be done by policymakers. It can be done by politicians. It can be done by civil society organizations, neighborhood groups, environmental groups, uh, social equity groups. Um, so, but a, a common thread of all these types of activities um, is that, that the, the interventions they do in a laboratory are tangible, they're visible, uh, they can measure things, um, and, and they want to do action. They want to, they're action oriented. They want to make a, a, a significant change. So, We've argued that there are three fundamental achievements of urban laboratories. Um, the first is that urban laboratories are situated. Um, and if, if you come from a geography or an urban planning background, an architecture background, you say, of course, you know, everything is situated. Um, but this is really important to think about um, in that urban laboratories are inscribed. They're, they're situated in a particular part of the city uh, and they have boundaries. And you, take, you create boundaries so you can say, this is inside of the laboratory and this other thing is outside of the laboratory. Um, and so it, it requires this channeling of resources, of data, of actors, of, of, of money uh, that you use to, to create a, a particular space where you can conduct experiments. Um, and so you use this idea of, of this label of urban laboratory to, to really legitimize experimental practices within a particular space. And so then it provides this platform, uh, this, this arena where different uh, experimenters can, can trial different urban, urban solutions. The second thing that it does uh, is it promises change orientation. 
So I talked about this earlier, but the idea of the urban laboratory is that we need to move away from incremental change in cities and tropic change in cities. And instead, we need to strive for things that are more radical, that are more novel. Um, so there's this idea with laboratories and experiments that we're dissatisfied with urbanization as usual. Uh, and we need to, to have a radical break from the present condition uh, in order to, to realize sustainable or resilient or, or livable futures. So we can say that there are a lot of values uh, that are underneath urban laboratories or that inform, so they're, they're, they're strongly normative uh, types of endeavors. Uh, they want to create more desirable futures. And then the third characteristic, um, and probably the most exciting one, is that urban laboratories are contingent. Uh, another way to say it is that they're uncertain or they're open-ended. Um, they're cutting edge, uh, and so they're risky. They might not work. So they come with rewards, but they also come with risks. Um, so another way to think about it is that urban laboratories are an idea that we, we need to act despite uncertainties, despite uh, gaps in knowledge. So in this way, we can see that, that experimenters in urban laboratories, they really embrace this idea that, that cities are, are complex uh, and that they have all kinds of different challenging uh, and unpredictable urban change processes. Um, and so unanticipated outcomes uh, are the norm. They're to be expected. Uh, but they provide us with new opportunities for learning. So uh, James Evans and I argue that urban laboratories present an attractive mode of governance that foregrounds knowledge and innovation. Okay, now we get into to what, is, what does this mean? What do these activities actually do with experiments? Um, well, what we suggest is that, is that urban laboratories and experiments are really a new way to, to govern cities. Uh, they're a way to, to really address these intractable, these really difficult, these wicked problems that we're experiencing today in cities. And we can make these changes happen more quickly. We can catalyze change. We can, we can speed it up uh, so, that, so, that, so that we can improve conditions uh, more quickly. And I think it's important to, to think about a couple of synonyms um, that I think I put in the, the, uh, the title. Um, one is test beds. Uh, so Francisca Engels and colleagues say that test beds are controlled experimental spaces that facilitate a kind of performance or hypothesis testing under presumably realistic conditions. Um, maybe this is a bit more scientific. Uh, maybe it's more of a focus on the test uh, than it is on an experiment or a lab laboratory. But for, for the purposes here, I think we can think of them as synonyms, that test beds and laboratories are kind of very similar. Another term that a lot of you have probably heard is, is platform. Uh, and uh, Antti Royko and colleagues say that a platform is any physical, technological, or social base on which socio-technical processes are built. Um, so we can think about things like Uber and Airbnb, um, where there's a massive amount of data that's being collected and, and analyzed. Um, there's a very strong emphasis on digitalization. There's less of a focus uh, with platforms on actual places, on actual districts, um, but um, there's, a, there's a, a similar experimental ethos that happens with platforms. And this idea of platforms are still being worked out. Um, so it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to really define exactly what a platform is. But let me give you um, just one brief example of an urban laboratory. Um, so this is uh, a longstanding, it's almost 20 years old, um, but this is called C Street. Um, this is in Seattle and C stands for Street Edge Alternatives. So this was um, uh, an intervention that was done in 2001 by the Seattle Municipal Government and they wanted to test uh, green infrastructure. So if we think about sustainable urban drainage systems, uh, which we call them here in Europe, or low impact development, which they call in the United States, um, but they were doing source control measures. Uh, so things like bioswales and ribbon curves and pervious paving. Um, what they wanted to do was they wanted to reinvent uh, a suburban street. So you can see in the picture that they've got this sort of single lane, very narrow, um, not very many parking spaces, um, that they've completely uh, reconfigured. And the key point here was that, that they did 
qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis to see what the effects of this were. Uh, and a lot of it was about water pollution and, and, and stormwater runoff. But they also talked to uh, a lot of different stakeholders. Uh, of course, they had to talk to the, the households uh, and see what they thought about this. But they also had a lot of conflicts. Uh, with respect to transportation, you can imagine they received a lot of criticism from emergency vehicles, from delivery vehicles, from trash and recycling trucks that said, we can't access this street anymore. It makes our jobs harder. Um, they also had uh, reduced parking on the street, uh, and that led to spillover on, on other streets. So they had neighbors on other streets that were not, not so happy about that. But as a result of this experiment, um, they, they felt that this was a, a good way to reconfigure suburban streets. Uh, and they did four other projects that were like this. Um, and they slowly incorporated it to become a, a standard way that, that Seattle designed streets. So I think an interesting thing here was that it was government led. Um, and they were, they were trying to test a new way to deal with stormwater. And that resulted in a new way of, of reorienting the street landscape. Um, and it was evidence-based, it was done out in the open, and it was a demonstration project, and it led to, to more projects. So, so this is an example of, a, of an urban laboratory. I'll take a break there. Are there any questions or comments, clarification? Okay, hi, Ellen. <laughs> yes, do I know that the street is curved? Yes. So, so they did that, the curving of the street, they did that to, they did that to slow down traffic um, and, and they wanted to create a more distinctive space. Um, and so they took a, a very linear street um, and I have, I have some before and after pictures. I don't, I don't have them here on this slide. Um, slideshow, but, but what they show is a very linear wide street and they turn it into a very narrow curvy street. And so the idea was they wanted to slow down traffic and they wanted to create a more distinctive streetscape. Um, and if you, if you ever go there to Seattle and you can go and look at this, it, it really is a huge difference uh, between one street and the next. And I think that's part of it was to, to have this demonstration appeal. Yes. Okay. So another good question. Can you elaborate a bit on, on your view of governance? <laughs> yes. I'm looking at different screens here. It's exciting. Um, yeah. So in terms of governance, um, what we're seeing, what we've seen maybe since the 1970s is a move away from government uh, where we have the public sector kind of leading on these large urban development issues to governance where we see a collaborative approach that might involve uh, the private sector, uh, it might involve nonprofit groups, uh, it might involve neighborhood groups. So we're starting to see this sort of dispersed uh, way of, of steering cities. Um, so that's what I mean by, by governance. I'll talk a little bit more about it because we're gonna, we're gonna talk about participation in a minute, but. Great. So, so good question. Hello. If the stakeholders did not like the idea, why was it why was it implemented in more places? Um, they did the the stakeholders on the street. Uh, they were consulted in advance, and there were I think there were nineteen households, and eighteen of the households were very happy about it. Uh, one householder was not happy about it, and he wasn't included. So, if you look. I don't think you can see it on this, this uh, photo, but there's one house that doesn't have the intervention uh, at one of the ends of the streets. Uh, but generally the stakeholders were happy about it uh, and it was more a collective issue of, of stormwater management um, that, that, that was, it had both positive and negative implications. Um, but they decided that the positive implications outweighed the negative implications and so they went ahead with it and tweaked it, they, they changed it a bit uh, when they went to different neighborhoods and did it in different neighborhoods um, and they fixed some of the things that didn't work so well. Um, but 
Yeah. So there, I think, I think this is a good point though, is that are always, there are always trade-offs uh, with experiments with these types of interventions. They're not always win, win, win. Uh, there's some things that have to go, for instance, the on-street parking was reduced a lot and that upset some people, but, but for the most part, I think it was largely, largely uh, a positive reception by the people on the street and, and, and by Seattle at large. Okay, one more question. Uh, an urban laboratory may not capture all cases as it's not a controlled environment. How does one extend results from an urban laboratory when an unexpected case arises? Yes, great, great question. I mean, this is, this is particularly important for transport. Uh, so let's say that you have a neighborhood that you turn into an urban laboratory, but, but roads, uh, light rail systems, uh, public transit, goes in and out of that, that, um, that urban laboratory. It goes in and out of those boundaries. So this is one of the big challenges of urban laboratories is that, that you can't control the things that go inside and outside of the boundaries. Um, so so how, do you, how do you control for those things the same way that you do in a natural science laboratory where you can control the, 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 uh, the, the different parameters, the different variables uh, within the walls of a laboratory. You can't do that in an urban laboratory. So that's a big trade-off. Um, so you have to always qualify the results that you get uh, and recognize that there, there are things that leak inside and outside of labor urban laboratories that you don't have any control over. So it's not, it's not a controlled space the way that a, a, a traditional laboratory has, has much more control, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a big conundrum, it's a big question about urban laboratories is, is, is what do you do about these sort of variables that are outside of your control? So it's a, it's a, it's a great question and I don't think that there's a, there's a good answer to that, but it's, it's an interesting uh, thing to think about. Great, great questions. Um, let me uh, continue uh, and we'll see if we can add to the discussion here. So, one of the things that, that um, we ask about is what happens with, with uh, experiments? What happens with the results? Um, if, it's a, if it's a failed experiment, of course, then we go back and we rework it. Uh, we try to retrial it. Um, so, so the experiment provides a space for, for failure, as I said earlier. But if it's successful, the idea is that you want to upscale it. You want to roll it out. Uh, you want to transfer the results elsewhere. So one of the, the underlying uh, logics of urban laboratories and experiments is this idea that, that we want to use these experiments to inform existing modes of governance. So this is regulations, this is policies, this is programs that the public sector and the local authorities uh, do. Um, and it could be a law, it could be a funding program, um, it could be some way that they encourage uh, a better streetscape, more electric vehicles, um, whatever it might be. Um, so it's this idea that, that we're using evidence-based policy, right? This idea that, that we do experiments, we get some results, we find out that the amount of traffic has been reduced, air pollution has been reduced, uh, people's happiness has been increased, and as a result, we should pass new regulations or policies uh, or programs. So this is what we call evidence-based policy. So it's not based on what politicians or policymakers think, oh, you know, this would be a really good idea. This is what we think sustainability is about. It's more about, okay, we have proof, we have data, uh, we've tried this in a small controlled setting, and now we think that, that we're gonna roll it out. Um, and so, so they use that to inform uh, their practices. Another way to think about it is to think about this trajectory of change. Um, so we can see if we start in the bottom left-hand corner, um, we can see that first what we do is innovate. Uh, so we want to, to find these experiments that we can try that can address particular issues that we have, we can develop solutions. Um, then we can, we, can, we can take those and we can demonstrate that change is possible. We can make this visible, we can make this public. So this is where we, we, we've assessed what's happening when we innovate uh, and we demonstrate that it works. And then finally, we propagate. Uh, so the idea is that, that we want to take these, these, uh, this data, these findings, and, and use that to inform policies, use that to inform regulations, programs, 
and upscale and disseminate and diffuse them to, to other locations. So interestingly, in the, in the, the urban laboratories and experiments and test beds and, and now platforms that I'm studying, this is one of the most difficult things is this upscaling. Uh, we tend to, to focus on that bottom left-hand corner of innovating. How do you set up the experiment? Who needs to be involved? Who's going to pay for it? How long is it going to happen? Uh, how are we going to collect data? How are we going to assess that data? And that, that stuff is not easy. It's, it's difficult to do. Um, but what I often see is that, is that a lot of these experiments happen. Uh, the funding goes away and they say, okay, we published the results. Here's a report. Here's a website. Here's a handbook. Uh, here's a list of best practices. Um, and that's the end of it. And to get it to, to where you can actually propagate uh, the learnings, the, the, the knowledge that you've gained from doing the experiment is very difficult. And I think one of the interesting things is to see that, that the way that this is often, the way that knowledge from experiments is often propagated is through individuals. So we'll have somebody who's working at uh, a place like Hammer you know, a very sustainable, um, noteworthy, world-leading, uh, district in in Stockholm uh, and then they go and start working at the Royal Seaport and so they take what they learn from from Hammerby and they take it to the Royal Seaport um, so they're the carriers of experimental learning uh, but what happens if they change jobs what happens if they retire what happens if they move away or they pass away um, so it creates really challenging processes of, of institutional learning how do you get the city of Stockholm how do you get the companies that are in Stockholm uh, to really learn from these types of experiments? So it's one of these big challenges uh, of experiments is, is how do you scale up? Um, how do you create these learning processes uh, so, that, so that you can actually take advantage of what you've learned from the experiments? Or is it just that these experiments are, 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 are good all by themselves? So one of the things that, that maybe a lot of people have started to see in the last five or seven, eight years is this idea of urban living laboratories. And, and some people think, oh, you know, an urban living laboratory is pretty much the same as an urban laboratory. Um, I think they're different. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to articulate how they're different. Um, the idea with a living laboratory is that experimentation should be uh, democratically steered. Uh, so, in other words, knowledge production, uh, the way that we do experiments, we can't just leave that to the experts. Uh, we can't just leave that uh, to the people that are trained to, to do uh, urban laboratory work. Um, instead, urban laboratories need to be shaped, they need to be conducted, they need to be um, understood by the people that are being most affected by it. So this is a, a definition from the European Network of Living Labs. So this is a, a, a member organization that was started in 2006, uh, and it was actually founded on notions of, of open innovation that came from information and communication technologies or from computer science. Um, and this, they, they really tied into these contemporary ideas about co-production and co-design and collaboration. Uh, and their idea was that what you do is you take innovation in the real world, so that's an urban lab, right? And then you add co-creation, and then you get an urban living lab. So that living part of it is the, the co-creation part of it. It's that inclusive, participatory, democratic part of, of, of situated uh, experimentation. And some of you might have heard about the, the quadruple helix. Uh, so initially we would have uh, government in the private sector, the left and right side of that diagram, um, they'd be involved in public-private partnerships. And then in the last 30 years, we started to get this idea of a triple helix where we had government and private sector in academia. And now we're starting to talk about the quadruple helix, which also includes citizens. Um, so this is a really interesting meeting point with urban living labs between people that advocate for uh, open innovation uh, in information and communication technologies and urban planners who have talked about participatory planning for four decades. So one side is based on open software movements and the other side is based on democratic theory and, and representation as it relates to urban planning practices. 
So the European Network of Living Labs has been very successful. Uh, they have over 440 labs. About 80% of them are in Europe, which makes sense. And I should also say that not all of them are actually urban. Um, some of them are in rural areas, suburban areas. Um, and there are thousands of urban living labs that are not part of the ENO network. Um, sometimes the living lab is being used as just a label. Uh, it sounds cool, so people use it, but other times there are actual principles of participation uh, that are being used uh, in, in very fundamental ways. So uh, Yulia Votenko uh, at Lund University and colleagues uh, say that urban living labs are emerging as a form of collective urban governance and experimentation to address a range of sustainability challenges experienced in cities and urban areas and to capture opportunities created by, by urbanization. Um, so this says that, that, that laboratories and experiments, they're not just a, a form of urban governance, they're a form of collective and participatory urban governance. Uh, so this is what brings sort of democracy to urban innovation. Uh, it suggests that, that we need to go beyond the experimental elite, elite and we need to actually include uh, residents, uh, citizens in, in these experimental processes. Um, and potentially, this is a, a, a goes beyond regulations, it goes beyond policies, it goes beyond programs and kind of conventional modes of, of, of what local authorities do, uh, and, and says th there are new ways to govern cities uh, that, are, that are deeply democratic. Um, so this puts citizens at the heart uh, of experimentation. Maybe I'll take a break there. Is there are there any questions? Uh, does that, does that clarify the, the ideas of, of governance a, a bit more? Okay, here's a question uh, from Facebook stream. Are there any urban laboratories in Sweden or anything that you have tested in Sweden using urban uh, laboratories. Um, I study urban laboratories. I don't. I don't do the testing myself. But there, there are a lot of urban laboratories. Um, one that comes to mind quickly is in Stockholm. There's a, a project called Grow Smarter that just finished, um, and it's an EU-funded project uh, that that's happening in in Orsta in various neighborhoods. Um, I would say that the Urban ICT Arena in Schista is also in, in a, a type of an urban laboratory. Um, Hammarby Hostad, the very famous sustainability district here in Stockholm, is, is a, uh, also an urban laboratory. Um, and they're in, in a, an interesting phase where they're finishing out the build out. Uh, they're not quite done building out Hammarby, but um, they're getting there. Um, and, and so they're, they're shifting now to more of a, a, a resident focus at Hammarby Hostad. So we can start to see the emergence of an urban living lab uh, at Hammarby. But we can see a lot in Malmo, there's Augustenbori is a, a really interesting district there where they've done a lot of experiments with green roofs, uh, with different types of, of uh, urban growing and, and gardening. Um, they've also got uh, the, the Western Harbor, which has been a really interesting development that they've done. Um, but there's questions uh, about what becomes an urban laboratory versus just a regular development. And I think there needs to be some sort of very focused um, emphasis on experimentation uh, and on measurement uh, of the changes. So you make a change in the built environment and then you measure that change uh, and see what the difference is. You know, how much CO2 have you reduced? How much air pollution have you reduced? How much more social interaction have you increased uh, in terms of, of ridership on, on uh, public transit, those kinds of things. Um, that you can do through through an experiment, but it's there's a, there's a requirement for it to be measured. So so anyway, to answer your question, yeah, there's lots of urban laboratories in Sweden. It sort of depends on how you define it, but yes. Okay, now I got a question from Harsha. Are there any particular requirements for setting up an urban lab? Can any city be set up as an urban lab? Yes, I don't think there's any there's not any specific requirements. Um, and the, I guess the challenge is that, that we see that, that a lot of um, people are using the urban lab without actually doing any sort of experiments. They just think it's an interesting term. So it's, 
you know, it's, it's, it's important to go in there and say, okay, it's an urban lab. Why is it an urban lab? What is it that you're doing that's different? Are you measuring the results of what you're doing? Uh, and then what are you doing with those results? Are you scaling them up? Are you, are you taking them elsewhere? Are you applying them to, to policies? Are you applying them to another district? Um, so it's, there, there's not any, any particular requirements. I mean, anybody, you could go out tomorrow and set up your own urban lab if you wanted to. Um, and, and it could be really interesting. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think there's any, I think any city can set up, uh, urban labs. Okay. I'll keep going. Good question, though. Oh, we've got another question here. Are there any examples of urban living labs that have been effective in tackling solving some of the wicked challenges created by urbanization, not only capture the, the opportunities? Yeah, I think there have. Um, um, I've written a bit about, um, about August and Bori, uh, this, this project that I've mentioned in, in Malmo, uh, and that's a 1950s um, residential neighborhood in Malmo that went under a lot of pressures and, and challenges in the 1980s and 1990s uh, with low income, with degraded conditions. Uh, and, and they really went in, the, the, the municipality of Malmo went in uh, and did a lot of really interesting work um, with the residents. Uh, and they've really transformed Augustin Bori into uh, a livable neighborhood now. Uh, it's very different than what it was in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so it, it, I, think, I think you're right though. I think your criticism or your, your question underlies a lot of these laboratories are really about you know, demonstrating the latest autonomous shuttle uh, or the latest smart technology. And you're saying, are, are we addressing any kind of the real problems that people face on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think they're harder to find, but I think there, there are examples of those. Okay, Mia. Can you elaborate on what you mean with upscaling being about learning, innovate, demonstrate, and propagate? Yes. So this is this is the, this idea that that we come up with results from an urban laboratory. We find out that because we adopted electric vehicles, that we reduce CO two emissions by thirty five percent. And then you say, okay, what what do we do with that 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 thirty five percent reduction? Um, so it says that we've learned that um, electric vehicles reduce CO2, and now we need to transfer that. Can we, can we make electric vehicles the norm throughout Stockholm or throughout Sweden or throughout the world? And how would we go about doing that? Um, so it's really about reflecting on the results and saying, okay, what's the next step? Where can, where can we take this? Can we create a law that outlaws all um, fossil fuel vehicles? Uh, can we create incentives that would uh, give people a rebate of 3,000 pounds or 3,000 euros uh, if they buy an electric vehicle? What types of interventions can we do? So it's, it's this really kind of reflective activity where we have some evidence, then we reflect on that and say, okay, what can we do with that? So I guess that's what the, the learning is, is to, to do an intervention and then reflect on, on, on what the, the outcomes of that intervention are. Okay, another one. Uh, is the universal income experiment tried in Finland regarded as an urban lab experiment? Meaning can this concept be extended to include social and economical considerations beyond just infrastructure? Hmm. I don't really know the, the universal income experiment uh, in Finland. Uh, it'd be fun to, to talk about that and see what that is. Um, to me, that sounds like maybe that's not an urban lab because it doesn't really have a, a physical component to it. I mean, is, is the universal income, is that more, it sounds to me like more of a financial or e economic intervention, um, which is interesting, uh, but maybe it doesn't have a, a particular um, district or maybe if it was implemented just in Helsinki, that could be an urban lab. Um, but yeah, usually, I mean, I guess uh, you, it's, this idea of infrastructure is interesting because I think I'm, I'm very interested in infrastructure. And I think most of these urban labs have some element of infrastructure uh, that are involved, you know, some sort of physical infrastructure, whether it's roads, whether it's public transit, whether it's pipes, whether it's wires, 
Um, I think there's something that's rooted in place that's, that's very material uh, about urban labs that, that interests me. Um, but I'd be interested to hear more about the universal income experiment in from the, maybe we can do that during the discussion. Okay, good questions again. So if we're talking about urban living labs and we're talking about this idea of, of bringing in citizens, of, of making these experiments and uh, interventions more democratic, um, I think one of the implications is that we're potentially we're moving into a new mode of urban development. So one idea is that urban living labs are incremental. So we start to make these small interventions. We, do, we monitor those, we assess those, and then we take the learning from that and we apply it elsewhere. So one of the interesting things is that we're starting to abandon looking at cities or looking at regions, and instead what becomes important is the innovation district, the place where we're doing the experiment. And this resonates with ideas about cities of quarters or cities of neighborhoods or, or little urban villages, right? Um, so it downscales cities and we start to think about how far can our experiment reach? Uh, and that's where we start to define our boundaries. And so we can start to think about this sort of patchwork quilt of cities where we have one district here and we have another district here and we have another district here. Um, and big questions arise is who's stitching together all these different patches, right? And what happens if there's nothing happening? What if no experiments are happening in a particular district? Does that district get left behind? Um, so there's, there's, there's kind of big social equity issues that we can think about with this incremental version as opposed to more of a, a, a comprehensive version of, of urban planning, uh, of urban development. Another um, idea about uh, urban living labs and about this idea of collaboration and participation is that decision making and the steering of cities and development of cities is no longer steered by the public authority. Instead, it's this collection, this quadruple helix, right? So it can have academics, it can have the public sector, it can have the private sector, it can have uh, the citizens that are all involved in, in developing cities. Um, and on the positive side, we say, yes, this could be more democratic. You know, if you, if you run it right, it's not necessarily going to be democratic, but hopefully, uh, if you do it right, you can have more voices involved and you can come to, to some compromise on how to, how to push cities forward. The downside of this is that it's harder to see who's responsible. We have these sort of opaque decision-making processes that happen. Uh, around tables with 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 this this broader group of people, and it's difficult to say who do we go to if things go wrong. Do we go to the public authority uh, if we're now in a quadruple helix? Um, so so it's it can make these governing processes a bit more opaque, a bit more hard to to understand. And then a third thing with urban living labs is emergence. Uh, so, so it's this idea that, that urban development is provisional and it's recursive. Um, and so we, we do an intervention, we assess that intervention, uh, and then we react accordingly. Um, so it becomes a, a very kind of responsive city, uh, and it's more adept at, at evolving and changing, uh, and it's more action oriented. But at the same time, we don't have as many sort of long-term plans. Um, that, that, that we're focused on, which is what traditional urban planning is about. So a couple of inspirational things, if we look at the history of urban development, we can start to see where these characteristics of incremental, of decentered and emergent uh, have been around for a long time. Um, so if we look in the, the bottom right, this is uh, Christiania. Uh, we'll know this is a famous eco-village uh, in uh, Copenhagen. Um, and this is a place where, where for since the 1970s, they've worked on this sort of bottom-up uh, collaborative mode of, of neighborhood governance. Um, it's not necessarily an urban lab. They're not necessarily measuring a lot of things that are happening there. They're not, uh, but they are doing this, this form of democratic uh, action-based uh, urban development uh, with, with very interesting uh, effects. 
Um, if you look at the top picture, that's Kowloon Walled City. Uh, this is a very famous squatter community that grew up over a number of decades in Hong Kong. Uh, and in the 1980s, they, they, they tore the whole thing down and they, they developed uh, buildings similar to the ones that are, that are surrounding it. Um, but again, this is kind of like a beehive or this is like an anthill that just developed incrementally from the bottom up. Um, there was a lot of problems in Kowloon Walled City with drugs, with prostitution, as you might imagine, uh, but also really interesting uh, sort of uh, emergent form of, of, of urbanization that happened uh, over a period of time. And again, not much of an experiment happening there because there weren't people that were actually measuring these things. Uh, but it has a lot of the same characteristics of being incremental, of being decentered, of being emergent. And then finally, um, one that we're probably more familiar with today, these pop-up urbanism, tactical urbanism, this idea um, that you can take over a city street uh, for a certain amount of time and you can demonstrate, uh, this is from the Kansas City Better Block project on the bottom left, um, and you can do an intervention. Uh, and, and here we're starting to see more measurement that's happening to say we had a certain number of people come out. Um, here's what happened with the traffic flows on that street when we did this intervention. Um, but this is, again, this is a, a, a form of urbanization that's more incremental, uh, that's more decentered, and that's more emergent, and that's more citizen-led. Uh, so I think these are really interesting things to think about when we think about experiments and we can learn from these things when we, when we, when we think about um, laboratories. And we're really moving away from this 20th century notion of sort of the comprehensive rational city. Um, and instead we're starting to, to see the rise of these small plans, these small different interventions. Um, so another way to think about it is let, let a thousand flowers bloom uh, and we'll see what emerges out of that. So it's a very different way to think about, uh, about cities uh, and about the way they, they change over time. So let me give you an example um, that, that's more related to, to urban lo living labs and experimentation. Um, this is a, a, an example from, from um, Santiago de Chile. Uh, this happened a few years ago, and it's a, a tactical urbanism approach. Um, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Martin Tironi and Matias Valderrama did a, a book chapter about this. And it's, it's a really fascinating case of citizen sensing uh, in Santiago. Um, so they wanted to create a, a low carbon district um, to raise awareness about carbon emissions uh, and about air pollution and about noise pollution. Um, and so over three days in 2016 in Santiago, uh, a non-governmental organization uh, did some temporary street paint, street painting. Uh, they set up tables for interaction. They created bike lanes. Uh, so it was this imaginary streetscape that was not dominated by, by automobiles, uh, as it was, as, as it has been for a long time. And at the same time, they recruited, um, citizens that lived on the street and on adjacent streets with a smart citizen kit where they were monitoring carbon dioxide, they were monitoring nitrogen emissions, they were monitoring light and sound and temperature and humidity. Um, and so, so through this measurement, they were creating smart citizens. Um, well, what happened? Um, they reduced uh, carbon emissions significantly, they reduced air pollution, they reduced noise pollution significantly, as you might imagine. At the same time, they created multiple conflicts with drivers uh, and residents. Um, you can imagine the drivers that were used to driving through there, taxi drivers and, and commuters that said, why are you blocking my street? Open this up. Um, there were a lot of problems when they had the citizen sensing. So if you see that top right um, um, monitor, this is where they, they, they had a, a sensor that they asked the, the citizens to put in their flower beds. Uh, really fantastic example. Um, but they had a lot of problems uh, with, with getting the citizens to connect these to their Wi-Fi networks, with unplugging the sensor because they wanted to charge their mobile phones or because they wanted to vacuum um, and then forgot to plug the sensor back in. So just kind of simple things. And that doesn't mean that the experiment was a, a failure, but what we realized from, from doing this is that um, there are a lot of frictions, there are a lot of irrational things that happen in cities. Um, 
that make scientific experimentation, that make these measurements very difficult. Um, but at the same time, when you start to, to intervene like this, you start to open up different imaginaries, you start to open up different visions for how the city could, could be different. Um, so it really starts to challenge the status quo uh, and really says, you know, what if we did have bicycle lanes? What if we invited people out to have a chat out on the street uh, about, about the city? So we start to see new processes of, 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 um, of urbanization that can potentially emerge through these types of interventions. I think I've got a couple of questions, so let's see what we've got here. Okay, great question for Mia. How to measure, evaluate if a living lab is successful or not? What KPIs, key performance indicators are usually used if there was any? Who should or have done the measurements evaluation? Great question. So, so the idea, I think, I think it depends on, on, on what it is that, that, that uh, you're working on with the living lab. You know, so if we look at the Santiago case study, uh, of course, they were, they were measuring physical parameters, air pollution, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, you know, humidity, noise, all these kind of things. But they were also measuring, doing qualitative measurements and talking to people and saying, what do you think about this, right? Um, and, and who should do the measuring? I think that's a super important question uh, about who should, be, who should be involved in, in doing these types of measurements um, and, and, and how are they qualified to do that? But we start to see this rise of, of citizen science uh, and, and we find out that the capacity of normal everyday residents uh, is really quite high to do this type of work. Um, but there are questions, you know, how, who do, do you pay these people to do this type of work? How do you train them? Um, you know, and, and are you open to, to different modes of measurement and evaluation? Um, or is it locked down? Um, and these are the, these are the big questions when you start to do urban living labs is how to do this type of collaboration, uh, in a way that that's democratically driven, um, rather than just using, citizens as, as uh, lab assistants, right? So I think there's some pretty, pretty significant eth ethical issues that can come up. Okay, what time are we getting to be here? Okay, we're about 30 minutes in. Let me, I just have some, some conclusions and then um, we can open it up for, for discussion. Um, so, so some reflections that I have. Um, I think one of the, the one of the things that I found by looking across these laboratories, whether they're urban laboratories or urban living laboratories, is that the context is critical. And I guess that's something you you probably obviously expect from a geographer and from an urban planner. Um, but what's interesting to me about about these experiments is that that they're in a particular locale uh, and they need to leverage the opportunities uh, and also address the challenges of that place, whether it be the people, whether it be the physical infrastructure, whether it be the economic system, whether it be the cultural and historical uh, histories. Um, but we need to, to really understand these physical and social characteristics of particular places when we're doing experiments. And so this moves away from sort of universal notions of, of urbanization and really gets us to focus on the particularities of, 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 of a specific locale. I think um, one of the challenges we have with laboratories is, is they're, they're short term. Uh, oftentimes these are two years or three years or four years, and they're, they're often based on external funding from the European Union uh, or from a national government. Um, and but to really reap the benefits, to really develop this new mode of, of urban governance, we need to have much longer term, 10 years, 15 years, uh, where we stage an intervention, we do an experiment, we assess that, uh, and then we recalibrate and we do another experiment. So, so it becomes this learning loops uh, that we get involved in. Um, but we rarely see those types of long-term commitments. Um, but when we do, it can, it, I think that could be really revealing if we did. We're starting to shift the different roles and responsibilities. I talked earlier about this idea of the quadruple helix. Um, so, so we're starting to see uh, that this raises new opportunities, particularly for more participation 
in cities by residents, by citizens, but it also raises uncertainties. And we don't know who's, who's actually responsible uh, for these different actions. Uh, who can we go to if something goes wrong? And then this emphasis on learning, uh, and perhaps this is the most difficult, um, but we're shifting away from kind of best practices and this is what works to let's try something, let's gather some data and then let's reflect on that, let's learn from that. Um, so a big question is how, how do these stakeholders, how do they learn from doing these experiments uh, and what do they do with, with their findings? And then a couple of questions. Um, one of the things I talked about at the beginning was this idea that, that experiments provide an opportunity for failure, uh, that they might not actually succeed. But I guess a big question is, is, um, is failure really an option? Um, oftentimes we do these experiments with public money um, and public authorities, of course, they don't want to advertise that you did uh, an intervention on the street and it didn't work. Uh, that you tried out uh, a low carbon technology and it wasn't successful, right? So, so is it possible to fail or do all of these urban experiments really need to, to be successful? The second is, is upscaling possible and is it, is it necessary? Um, so we talk about this idea of, of transferring ideas from experiments to regulations, to policies, to programs. Um, we have plenty of toolkits and handbooks, um, but maybe we don't need to upscale. Maybe it's really about developing a new mode of, of you know, very local kind of neighborhood forms of, of governance. Um, and, and we start to do experiments as, as an end in themselves. Um, so I guess that's an open question is, is do, we, do we really need to upscale? Uh, or is that something that we should, we should question? Um, is this a new mode of governance? Uh, are, we, are we really informing existing modes of governance with experiments or are we developing these new modes of collaboration uh, that are much more uh, inclusive, that are much more diffuse? Um, and if we do, um, what are we sacrificing? Is there somebody that's still looking out for the, the general public uh, and, and, and thinking about the people that are not involved in the experiments, for instance? And then finally, is this, is this sufficient? Is this enough? Um, and I know we're in strange times right now, uh, but if we think about climate change, if we think about economic disparities, uh, if we think about uh, economic uncertainties, is this going to help us with these wicked problems that we have? Is experimentation, our laboratories, our li living laboratories, can they live up to their hype? Can they actually help us uh, address these issues and, and create a better world? So I'll end with a quote. Um, this is by Orit Halpern uh, and colleagues, and they did, they did a really great uh, study of uh, Songdo in, in South Korea, and they talk about testbed urbanism, uh, and, and they state that these experiments will concern us long before their outcome is clear. And I guess what I would say to that is that we don't know where these things are going. Uh, the, the potential to transform urban governance in fundamental ways is still an open question. Um, and there are, there are lots of opportunities that come with experiments, uh, including a wide range of stakeholders, um, but also a lot of contradictory goals. Uh, there's potentially winners and losers, and there's potentially people that are left out of experimental processes. Um, so experimentation opens up new modes of, of governance, new modes of politics, uh, but with significant but uncertain outcomes for the future. So thank you. Okay, so, oh, this is bad. Um, okay, so I think the official time for our seminar is quite over, but uh, if you want to stick around, ask more questions, we can continue to chat with each other and um, maybe use the Q&A and chat to ask Andrew more questions. Um, yeah. This was it, but, uh, but we also have uh, upcoming seminars, like I suggested before. So please uh, go onto our website and check for the upcoming events and sign up.
And now let's see if we have more questions. Yes. Yeah, I, see, I see a couple of questions on the Q&A. Okay. So, so Visak says, uh, sometimes generation, gentrification projects with public money, for example, Harlem in New York City, revive the neighborhood while increasing the property prices, pushing away the original but poor inhabitants. How do we ensure that these otherwise good intention initiatives happen more democratically and equitably? Great question. So, so you know, this is, if we think about uh, experiments and we think about interventions, um, we need to think about who's, who's involved in those things and what are the, you know, potential outcomes. Um, you know, and, and, and using public money to increase property values, which then pushes out particular populations, I think we would, most of us would agree that's probably not a desirable outcome. Um, so creating a, you know, a, a, a process of, of a, an experiment of a laboratory that, that considers these negative implications uh, and designs the experiment, designs the intervention so that it, it doesn't push out um, the, the low income residents, um, you know, that, that's critical. You know, so that would be something you could see that in an urban laboratory, that process of gentrification being supported. But you would think with an urban living laboratory, if it's run in a proper way, that we wouldn't have, um, that they would address that problem rather than allow that to happen. So that's a, that's a great, great question. And then Harsha says, uh, in a hypothetical case of a body conducts an experiment in an urban lab and something goes wrong. In this case, who takes responsibility? Does this mean that the government always has to be the one of the experiment conductors due to liability issues? Interesting, interesting question. I think that I, I was just trying to think about any sort of experiments that I've seen that have not involved a public authority, a government actor. And I think all of them do because they're all involved in um, the public realm. Right, so they're on streets, they're on sidewalks, they're in uh, public squares, um, they're on public property. Um, of course, experiments happen all over the place. Uh, corporations are, are famous for doing experiments within their own research labs. Uh, but when you start to spill out into the public realm, then there seems to be a, a public, uh, public sector actor who's always has to be involved and who at least sanctions the work, who at least allows the work to happen even if they're not actively engaged in it. Um, so yeah, but I, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and then what happens if it goes wrong? Um, well, hopefully we have the, the experimenters to go back to uh, and, and, and make them responsible uh, for it. But I, it, it raises an interesting question about is the public um, authority, are they gonna be the ultimate responsibility for for an experiment if it goes wrong. And I haven't, you know, I haven't heard about that many failed experiments because we don't publicize them very much. You know, people don't want to talk about failures so much, but it would be really great if we could learn from these and find out what happened with the failure um, and, and how did they address it. Okay, I think uh, this is where we end. Oh, wait, we have one more question. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> okay, question from, from Rebecca. Linked to the concluding question, is this sufficient in light of the need for rapid transformation of cities to reach global sustainability goals? For example, on decarbonization in line with the Paris Agreement, do we have time to let a thousand flowers bloom? From the climate science community, I hear increasing calls for long-term and determined actions relating to we need to choose the path and not scatter our actions. There is a clear challenge to doing so inclusively. Could urban living labs support that kind of rapid, efficient transformation? Yeah, no, I mean, you bring up a really great uh, point. Uh, and I think it, it's really about, do we have time to do this experimentation? Do we have time to kind of mess about with a thousand flowers blooming and wait to figure out which one is the right one? Or do we just need to take decisive action and focus everybody on one particular uh, intervention, uh, you know, or a set of interventions? Um, I think that's a real tension. 
Uh, and I think uh, emergence, you know, it takes time. Uh, if we look at ecology, if we look at nature in the way that, that, that you know, natural selection uh, occurs, uh, it takes, you know, millions of years for that to happen. And we don't have that type of time, with, particularly with respect to climate change. Um, so could urban living labs support that kind of rapid, efficient transformation? I mean, it, I, think, I think what sort of the, the, the unfortunate conclusion that I would come to is that democracy tends to be not very good at that kind of thing, at that sort of rapid, efficient transformation. The rapid, efficient transformation happens when you have dictators, when you have some strong top-down direction uh, that happens. And when we are inclusive, when we allow for uh, multiple voices, that tends to, to slow things down uh, quite a bit. So I haven't seen any sort of very strong ways that, that this has happened, you know, sort of bottom up directed action, uh, rapid, efficient transformation, as you put it. Um, so, you know, maybe that's a, I don't know if that's an intractable tension, but I'd love to see some examples where, where people have, have, have showed, you know, what actually people can come together and they can take action and they can do things that are pretty radical. But I think if you look at things like transition towns, I think those are examples where we've seen small groups of people that have come together and have been able to, to really shift the way that they live and the way that they work in fundamental ways. So maybe that's an inspiration to look at is, is this idea of transition towns. Okay, all right then. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andrew. I think it was, it was a really good seminar, like Rebecca just said. <laughs> um, thank you all for all the questions. They were really interesting. And if you want to still continue uh, speaking with Andrew, you know where to find him, I think. Um, good, I think we can end it here. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, see you for the next seminar.